The year is 2014. Dark Souls 2 has just released amidst a ton of hype and anticipation. The Souls franchise overall is just now getting out of the dude have you heard of this game territory and into the mainstream. Because across the internet, Dark Souls is everywhere. Epic PvP montages, lore videos, challenge runs, you name it. It is a wonderful time to be a fan. When all of a sudden, an unexpected visitor appears on the horizon. What could that be? Is, is that a leak? So soon after Dark Souls 2? Gonna have to have a little looky here. Guns? Wolfmen? Top hats? And the name Project Beast. Now, at the time, people had no clue what to make of this leak. All we really knew from software to be working on generally was the highly successful Souls series. So people instantly assumed this had to be Demon Souls 2, which seemed unlikely, Dark Souls 3, a little too soon, or something altogether new. Many people self-titled it Beast Souls. But what these leaked blurry images grew into, what truly became of Project Beast, surpassed all expectations and hopes. It was at E3 the very same year where it would be revealed to all of us mouth breathers what this mystery really was. Now, I think it's important to remember the lead up here to Bloodborne's release, the baseless theory crafting, the hype, the stupidity, because it's kind of an essential part of the From Software experience. And Bloodborne coming in as just a new game from the company, no S words stapled on there anywhere, was kind of a big deal. I personally bought a PlayStation 4 solely to play this game, and I remember going to the midnight release at a really shitty GameStop with one of my best friends, then rushing home to get real stinky with it and just play for several days straight. Bloodborne consumed me, and I absolutely fell in love with it, just like all of the Souls titles prior. And what do you know? Almost seven years later, after many, many playthroughs, I can look you in the eye and say with confidence, Bloodborne is one of the greatest video games ever made. Rich atmospheres, spectacular level design, grueling challenge and rewarding game systems help to deliver one of the more flawless experiences you can have sitting on a couch. So, welcome to the review everyone. This is the third full game review here on my channel and you guys seem to really enjoy them, so hey, I appreciate the support. I am Ghost, your host, and if you enjoy this video, Please do consider subscribing if you want to see more just like it. I also have to say, obviously, there are light spoilers ahead for Bloodborne, so proceed with caution if you must, and let's get started. So first I like to talk game premise. I mean, what are we doing here? What is Bloodborne? Why do I even exist? Well, I can't help you with that last question, but Bloodborne is a third-person action RPG set in the crumbling gothic city of Yharnam and beyond. Much like the Souls games, your purpose and goal at the beginning of the game are cryptic, but as you conquer areas, defeat bosses, and uncover secrets, your place in the world and story become a bit more clear. Now, while this is considered to be a single-player game, I guess, multiplayer functionality, as always with FromSoft games, is a huge part of that experience. Helping other players, getting help, murdering other players, getting murdered, interacting with community messages left on the ground, this is really what it's all about. And even right now, today, I bet you can hop on PS4 and there's a healthy amount of people still online. So yes, this is a PlayStation 4 exclusive, actually, also playable on PS5. So sadly, if you don't own or have access to one of those consoles, you're gonna have to wait in line with the rest of them for the PC port. Hey, it might come out in the next, like, 30 years, you never know. But I'll bet that if you've only heard one thing about Bloodborne, it's probably that it is extremely hard. And it certainly is. Difficulty resulting in death is a huge part of the design philosophy of Bloodborne and you should be prepared to get absolutely spanked as you learn the flow of combat, where to look for threats before they get the jump on you, etc. It's a classic exercise of trial and error, but you will most likely find yourself in the error column to start. Through character builds, weapons, armor sets, fashion, there are tons of ways to personalize your character and your playthrough, and the more comfortable you get, the more you can experiment 
and really unlock all there is to be enjoyed here in Bloodborne. But hold on, because before all of that, the number crunching, the PvP, and so on, it begins real slow, here in Yarnum. One of the most obvious strengths of Bloodborne to me upon starting is the setting. While the Souls games are excellent in their own right, Bloodborne takes a more specific and sort of period approach. Yarnum is a Victorian-esque city, a place that oozes with history, architecture, art, and tragedy. As expected, we arrive long after the city's golden age. Yarnum is in ruin. Beastmen roam the streets, corpses line the walkways, and plague has ravaged the land. This paints a pretty grim picture, a world of death and antiquity, now a jungle of the infected and insane. But any game worth its salt is going to take you on a journey, and throughout your playthrough, Bloodborne will take you much further from Yarnum than you can really even imagine at the start. The game's setting masterfully shifts along with the plot, from Victorian Gothic to Old God Cosmic. Nightmarescapes, old forests, ancient castles, and more. You see, Bloodborne transforms into a game about much, much more than hunting beasts. Lovecraftian horror eventually takes center stage, which sounds potentially jarring, but the way that the game opens on these themes slowly and introduces them to the player over time is nothing short of masterful. I just find the sense of scale and history in this game is kind of overwhelming in a really good way. And equally overwhelming can be the plot. I think trying to fish reason out of the game's events the first time around can be, uh, confusing, let's just say. A bit like putting together a puzzle in a candlelit room where you can make out shapes, but you can't truly see shit. Some people really don't like this aspect of the game. I mean, there's a healthy amount of people out there that want to boot up their video games, play the story, finish it, and move on to the next one. Hey, I feel it. Your time is valuable. And more power to you, but if you want to find us thinking gamers, we'll be over here in the corner reading the item description of a baby squid and contemplating our place in the universe and fabric of time. But all jokes aside, Plot of Bloodborne is incredible, if you can figure it out. And that's going to take a little bit of work, reading item descriptions, paying close attention to in-game dialogue, using your imagination, and of course, binging a bunch of Vadi video lore videos. I mean, I think it's kind of difficult for me to say that, you know, this is the story, because it's a thing of interpretation, discovery, and mystery. So I guess I'll just share my short interpretation of what's going on here at the beginning, just the setup. So long ago, a race of humanoid dudes called the Thumerians discovered something under what is now Yarnum. Something old, and in my opinion, terrifying. The Great Ones. Beings of immense power that could really only be described as godlike. Through this discovery, they uncovered what is known as the Eldritch Truth, and their society was forever changed. They became guardians of these old ones and even took part in interspecies marriage and sexual relations. Hoo hoo, baby. But eventually, the Great Ones desired to return to the cosmos and leave the Thumerians' plane of existence. Only a few of them ended up being left behind, like Ebridus, one of the bosses in the game. Over time, the absence of the Great Ones caused the Thumerian society to crumble. Attempts to use the Great Ones' blood, or as it is called in game, the Old Blood, to ascend along with their masters, ended in disaster and a plague of beasthood. Now fast forward quite a bit to the more modern humans in the story, building a city and calling it Yarnum in honor of an ancient Thumerian queen, and eventually, scholars from the school at Bergenworth discovered this very same ancient blood. And what do you know? This godlike blood has extremely powerful healing qualities. It would be a shame if someone like established a church and kind of overused and abused that power of the healing blood. Humans, like their ancient counterparts, attempt to use it for good, with different opinions and practices arising regarding the blood, but instead begin spreading this very same beasthood plague all over their awesome city, and it's a complete mess. So you are here now as a hunter. The game begins on the night of the hunt where the beasts that roam the streets are to be cleaned up. So that sounds somewhat straightforward, right? Not at all. You see, the storytelling in this game is kind of based purely on concepts. Even on the official wiki, the lore section is broken up into, literally, main story concepts. Think of it like a series of threads to pick up as you explore and just add to your knowledge base on each of these things. But the story gets into some seriously incredible and abstract areas with the moon presence, the hunter's dream slash nightmare, the school of Mensis, and a fair share of twists and turns. I mean, this is stuff that should be experienced and explored firsthand. I really don't want to spoil too much. And even if you have played it already, 
Play it again. Let's all keep learning about this story because there's so much here. I definitely plan on making some character studies in my Hero and Villainpedia series at some point to explore the plot of Bloodborne even more. Another huge thematic tool in this game is the moon. It acts as a visual marker that indicates when you have made some step of significance in your journey, a way to show the passing of time and your progress being noted. You can think of these world states as representative of how your character, the hunter, is being perceived by the world and its inhabitants. At the beginning of the game, it seems to be just getting dark. The hunt is about to begin. This is called the evening phase. Yarnum citizens can all kind of be talked to, and everything is about as normal as it will ever be again. After defeating Father Gascoigne, you will have your first transition of time to sunset, and things just start to get a little more odd. Progressing further will bring you to the Vicar Amelia boss fight, a tough landmark boss for the early game, and the fight that will officially bring you to nightfall. Certain enemies now sleep, the path to the forest is opened, Yarnum citizens begin to succumb to the plague or go a little cuckoo, and Patches begins to appear. The final phase is known as the Blood Moon. Activated after defeating Rom the Spider, this is where the wheels fall off the wagon. Citizens are toast, you hear crying babies, big ol' alien dudes, and NPCs who need help or saving are out of luck. The jig is up, baby. You have reached the end game. Needless to say, I fucking love the moon phases and how they're used. I mean, the first time I played, it just kind of blew me away. I remember killing Rom, approaching some bloody lady, and all of a sudden it's like, oh god, what have I done? Any game that makes you feel your impact on the world gets a big old chunky thumbs up from me. And Bloodborne does a wonderful job of putting your hunter in the driver's seat. It totally feels like you are the force putting all of these things in motion. But one of your main avenues of making sense of things, like the Souls games, are the NPCs speckled throughout the world to interact with. Bloodborne is home to some of the coolest characters that this company has ever made, and the game straight up would not be the same without them. Now maybe this is just me, but I find Bloodborne to be a depressing as shit game, in a good way. I mean, the feeling of melancholy and dread that hang over the entire game world is kind of one of the most unique things about it. So when you unexpectedly run into another living, breathing, not insane person, it's like a sip of cold blue Gatorade on a hot summer's day. Early on, however, you will mostly be interacting with folks holed up in their homes, waiting for the hunt to be over. There are these little lamps on the ground that indicate you can knock on a door or call to a window and talk to whoever may be inside. This is where writing and voice acting performance just do an incredible job to humanize these citizens. I don't reckon you're from round here. Well, stuck outside on a night of the hunt. Oh, um, you poor, poor thing. <laughs> I mean, some of these interactions become little storylines that are extremely memorable. One of my favorites in the entire game being probably the first person you'll interact with, Gilbert in Central Yarnum. He helps you out, gives you directions, and even a weapon from behind his barred window, but is fighting off some kind of sickness, coughing and whatnot. And as you progress, so too does his plague. It's a heartbreaking little storyline. Well, I don't think I could stand if I wanted to, but I'm willing to help if there's anything that can be done. <laughs> Another great one is the little girl who's been left alone and waiting for her dad to return from the hunt. But, ooh, oopsie. Her dad is one of the early bosses, Father Gascoigne. Oh, thank you. My mum wears a red jeweled brooch. It's so big and, and beautiful. You won't miss it. Oh, I mustn't forget. If you find my mum, give her this music box. But if you can kind of connect these dots and figure this might be her father, you can play the music box during the fight and it'll kind of freak him out and stun him. Then later, she tries to escape, so you better kill the big pig or she gets eaten. Then you can meet her sister and try to help them both to safety, all of this without ever seeing their faces. I think this is pretty brilliant writing and interactive storytelling, and it adds a ton to the world building and makes this feel like a place that not so long ago was normal, but it is quickly declining. Other memorable NPCs are Eileen the Crow, Valter with his incredible helmet, Alfred, Willem who put eyeballs on the inside of his skull, and of course Patches who takes on the appearance of a spider here in Bloodborne. But if you want to learn more about him as a character and an overarching presence throughout all the From Software games, check out my Villainpedia entry on him. But the point here is, so much of the heavy lifting is done beautifully by the characters. It's always so refreshing to encounter someone who doesn't want to rip your head off that even the characters who are dicks are nice to see. 
But now I want to get right into a meaty part of this review and talk about combat. This is, after all, what you're going to be doing most of the time during gameplay. Well, Bloodborne combat is largely based around three main mechanics, dashing, rallying, and parrying. Dashing is the first thing that will stand out to anyone coming from the Souls series. Bloodborne is a fast-paced game, and I mean very fast-paced, where Dark Souls overall encourages you to smartly use a shield, position yourself, and just kind of heft your big ass into battle. Bloodborne says, hey, hit the nitrous, let's speed this dang thing up. And you are practically flying around the game, dashing like Naruto. No shield necessary, baby. Quite frankly, I love the dash mechanic. It feels extremely responsive and satisfying to like sidestep a big enemy attack and then hop in their face and give them the business. But I think for me, it's really enjoyable to play this way within a game formula that I already know and love. It feels like From Software was willing to experiment to show their range of understanding what good gameplay is. This was later further expanded with Sekiro, and it looks like Elden Ring is going to introduce some new stuff too. The rally mechanic, though, is where things get really interesting. When you take damage here in Bloodborne, your health bar will temporarily show that lost health as orange, not yet actually missing. This is an indicator to you that you can haul your ass back into the fight, hit the enemy in return, and regain that missing health. Now, adding that to the dash mechanic and the speed of the game overall leads to, well, maybe the most badass feeling combat ever. You're encouraged to play with bloodlust, reckless abandon, riding the line of risk and reward like the edge of a knife. As many enemy attacks, especially early on, are likely to take a huge chunk of your life away. This just adds a level of adrenaline to even the most basic, backtracky gameplay the game has to offer. It feels like there is nowhere to hide, and I love it. The final of the three main mechanics is parrying, but unlike Dark Souls, you don't need a well-timed shield deflection to stagger your enemy. Instead, how about a nicely timed bullet or rain a buckshot? This is largely the role that firearms ended up playing in the game, and staggering an enemy at the right time opens them up for a visceral attack. A free window to just deal a shit ton of damage, now who doesn't like that? Okay, so in short, the combat is very good, but what is combat without some tools, baby? Some weaponry. And Bloodborne does things a little bit differently in this regard. I would say From Software took a bit of a leap of faith and brought the overall number of weapons players can use way down from the Dark Souls titles. Dark Souls 2 that released just the year prior or so ended up with 221 total weapon options in the game. I may be off by a few, but that is a huge part of build variety for us the players, right? I mean, when you've used a ton of the better or more popular options, it's so fun to make some funky builds, explore some of the more awkward and unique weapons out there. I mean, that's why they put them in the game. Well, when Bloodborne launched, 15 weapons were out there to be obtained. 15. Add in the left-handed weapons, most of which are just guns used to stagger your enemies, and you are at the grand total of 23. This was one of the few disappointments I had back then, and I still have right now today. Of course, the DLC later added on a healthy amount more, bringing the total number of right-handed weapons to 26, but still a far cry from the amount of variety I think a lot of people expected. But one key aspect to these weapons that you have to take into account is that they are all multifaceted devices, not just like a sword. They are trick weapons, and each have multiple forms of use, with different movesets, attack speeds, damage, and so on depending on the form you are in. Take for example, the Threaded Cane, which doubles as Grandpa's beat stick and a slick whip to attack enemies from a distance. Or the Kirk Hammer, which doubles as a short sword that kind of slams into the handle of this big hammer. Now that's quite a bit of versatility in one weapon. So while the overall number of weapons is indeed low, the creativity and design and fun to be explored is a very exciting part of the game if you're going in blind. The problem for me just arises when I have played over like a thousand hours of the game and feel like I've pretty much used everything. I mean, this whole area of the Hunter's Workshop where you improve these contraptions. What if you could like break weapons down and combine them? Take the whip function of the threaded cane and kind of bolt it onto the end of the Kirk hammer. What if there was just more customization like that? It would be pretty damn cool and add a lot more build variety. But I would be playing myself and you if I didn't at least admit that the weapons that are in the game are fucking awesome. I mean, the Burial Blade, the Whirly Gig Saw, Ligarius' Wheel, the Church Pick, there's so much creativity and fun, man. You really can't go wrong when you reach for any of these weapons. All of them are further improved and augmented using blood gems, socketed items that you equip on your weapons based on shape, and this adds enough of a progression system to keep you busy and satisfied through your playthroughs. 
But who gives a sheesh about that? I mean, what's your gosh darn build, dude? How's your character gonna be yours? Character builds, as you've probably gathered by this point, are a huge aspect of the game, and your choices will make you more effective with certain weapons and less so with others. The attributes or stats here are how you hammer out your choices, and you can't even wield certain items without reaching certain thresholds. The starting class you pick will set you on a potential path, but it doesn't really matter that much unless you're seriously crunching numbers. The most basic of builds can be focused on the following stats. Strength, which is rather self-explanatory. Big man, big weapons. Then you got skill, which is kind of like dexterity. A measure of elegance and critical damage. Third is blood tinge. Now, blood tinge is interesting and mostly scales with the damage you deal with firearms, but also certain blood damage based weapons like the Chikage and the blood letter. Lastly, you have arcane, which is like the intelligence stat, I guess you could say. More magic ish. A stat that empowers arcane damage and boosts item discovery. But with all those possible pure builds, you of course will combine them. I mean, strength and arcane is a ton of fun for me, as is skill and blood tinge. And once you're discovering some of those weapons we've discussed, you will almost certainly be like, damn it, I want to change my entire build for this, man. And of course, that's one of the best things about games like this, the sheer amount of possibilities when you're thinking purely about a playthrough and a build. I mean, I can guarantee you're gonna wanna try everything out there at some point. But once you get comfortable, if you're really trying to min-max for PvP or challenge runs or whatever, you can always look into some of the many online resources for specific builds. Cause each stat in the game has like soft caps, so you can get really picky and just craft your perfect character. But another thing I like about this system is that it's pretty hard to straight up ruin a build your first time through. Say for the first 15 levels, you're thinking you want to be a pure 100% strength chad. But you have a change of heart when you find the rifle spear. I mean, you want to change your build? Go ahead, man. Oh, but baby. <laughs> Maybe you won't be maximizing your damage, but the game is absolutely beatable with a bit of a bunk build. It almost feels like that glorious depth and experimentation of character building is totally optional, which I think is just fine. Though it is worth noting, and this is a biggie, that this game features no way to respect your character. Some people just hate this. They get so angry, and I kind of get it. But listen, I'm a nut job. I enjoy starting new characters for the sole purpose of trying out a whole new build on a new adventure, and that character being emblematic of that build. But that's just me. One other kind of side stat I wanted to mention here though is Insight. Insight is really, really cool and plays a huge role in the game. But this isn't a stat you have to invest in as far as a character build. Everyone gets insight. Think of it as like your Lovecraftian horror woko meter. How much you have represents the amount of inhumane knowledge you have acquired by exploring the game and revealing some of the cosmic truths to be found. Insight can be gained in several ways. Killing bosses, uncovering certain areas, helping other players kill bosses, consuming madman's knowledge, killing another player, and just around the world. There are even some horrifying enemies in this game that steal insight from you permanently. Having more insight is kind of like a ladder of weirdness. Once you get your first, the doll in the Hunter's Dream home base area comes to life and helps you level up, as well as a few other minor things. At 15 insight, certain enemies in the world become a bit stronger. At 40, Amygdala big cosmic dudes are now visible in the Cathedral Ward area, and a new song will play in the Hunter's Dream. Eventually at 60 insight, you can hear the faint crying of a baby. This is yet another aspect of Bloodborne that perfectly marries functionality and flavor. Because insight is also the currency you spend to summon other players to your world if you need help. Just the way the game blends so many concepts with the game world is really impressive to me. So okay, you got your build, you got your weapons, but who are you gonna use all these fancy tricks on? I mean, who's gonna catch these hunter hands? Gotcha, bitch! Worry not, my friend, for Bloodborne is home to a bunch of humongous asshole enemies and frustrating but incredibly designed bosses. The variation in enemies, though, is something that really impressed me on my first playthrough. The game hoodwinked the hell out of me, thinking, okay, got a big wolf man. It'll probably progress to an even bigger wolf man. Maybe some wolf women, maybe some wolf kids, maybe even a bear, I don't know. But before you know it, you're fighting the big pale church guys, then the snakehead staggery guys, then the little blue homies, and these horrible things, and it's like, okay, you got me. I have no idea what to expect at all, and that is a great feeling. 
Some of the even more basic enemies are really tough to get a handle on too. I mean, I bet that bigger black wolf creature in the first part of Yarnum has the highest kill count of players of anything in the game. The speed I mentioned earlier has to be matched, exceeded, or thrown off by your enemies to keep the difficulty and pacing correct. So some of these encounters end up having your head spinning a few times before you can conquer them. It's great. Then there are the bosses. Oh yeah, baby, the main attraction. Every fight is incredibly unique, appropriate for the area, and for the most part, very hard. Some are difficult and fair, fights that make you work for it, and once you kill the boss, you almost want to bow in respect. Others are hot dog water dookie poop crap, like Rom the spider, and they're only tough because you have to kill a shit ton of spiders. Then you got the ones where you want to squat on their grave the moment the fight concludes. So obnoxious and rabid in their difficulty that victory, when finally achieved, helps you attain a state of euphoria even Fedora Man has not reached. Then you have the actual scumbags. Dick shit bastards that deserve to stub their toe every time they get up to do anything at home. But these are the most incredible fights the game has to offer. The Orphan and Lawrence mostly come to mind for me here. I mean, holy smokes, boys. These fights made me grow a beard and turned it gray all at the same time. But something that you probably already know is that you can never predict what bosses you are going to struggle with in these games. I mean, going into it, a buddy of mine was ahead of me, and he warned me about Martyr Ligarius up at Canehurst Castle. So by the time I get there, I'm shaking in my boots. I expected serious punishment and a steep learning curve, but I walked right in and kicked his ass. This very same friend of mine destroyed Ludwig first try, and I think I lost like three days of my life trying to beat him. I think that's the beauty of Bloodborne. The combat and weapons and toolkit given to the player is so dynamic, it allows each person playing to really be themselves and adapt, as corny as that sounds. It doesn't force you to play a certain way, or force you to use a certain weapon or strategy. So naturally, everyone plays the game and struggles in their own way. But the most underrated aspect of the bosses, to me, is the emotional resonance and narrative impact they can have on you. I mean, once you're piecing things together plot-wise, coming in contact with Ludwig, Maria, and many others gives you that oh shit moment, and it feels really easy to connect with the narrative through the bosses. It's a really powerful thing to me as someone who loves story. But this is also done really well through two other important avenues for any masterpiece, art style and music. Bloodborne overall, I would say, is a dark game, visually. I mean, most places you look, black, brown, gray, blood red, these are the palettes you're spending several dozen hours surrounded by. So it's really up to detail and style of the game world, enemies, armor sets, environments, and so on, to stand out and give you a cohesive piece of fantasy world that's still enjoyable to explore. I think a huge strength here is that the developers seemed to lean into the fact that this would be a terrifying place to actually visit. I mean, many locations border on horror game levels of dramatic lighting, set pieces, and design. From the darkest of interiors to blood moon lit exteriors, the art direction of the game is utterly incredible to me. A high watermark for From Software for sure. Then when the game starts popping off into eldritch horrors and cosmic entities, the execution of artistic ideas is spectacular. I mean, the contrast of themes visually and narratively are just done so well, it's crazy. And it makes me that much more excited for maybe someday a potential Bloodborne 2, because quite frankly, I cannot get enough of this right here. Meanwhile, the music creates one hell of a haunting tone, and adds to that sort of melancholy, depressing feeling I mentioned earlier. There's also, of course, the hyperactive boss themes to really make you feel like your house is on fire the entire time and keep you on the edge of your seat. There's just really good stuff here. Audio and visuals overall are incredible. Then little details like getting covered in blood as you fight through enemies and the ghastly glow of the little lamps. I mean, ugh, it's just so good and like Halloween-y and I like it. So now I want to talk about some of the like extra stuff you could say. And let's start with Chalice Dungeons. If there is one aspect of Bloodborne that I guess you could say is polarizing, it's definitely Chalice Dungeons. Now remember earlier when talking about the plot, we learned about the Thumerians in the city under Yarnum. Well here, my good man, is your chance to go spelunking. But this isn't just a normal game area that you kind of discover and make your way through like normal. No siree. These are sort of a separate game mode altogether. 
Naturally, you will come across chalices out in the world, and combining them along with special materials will grant you access to one of these tombs. It's almost like a dungeon crawler, with enemies, bosses, and items set out in a linear mini-level full of traps and dangers for you to traverse with a boss waiting for you at the end. But it's also a lot more than that, because once you beat that boss, you go to the next layer, or floor, kind of. It always reminded me a lot of Binding of Isaac and other roguelike games. There are a total of 35 named chalice dungeons to enter, I believe, maybe even more, with different themes, areas, enemy types, and bosses. The base dungeons are set, but the root dungeons are randomly generated, and it's really cool that they did that, because that random factor will make you see some weird shit, like bosses walking around like normal enemies, it's a ton of fun. Now there is a load of information on these around the wiki and on YouTube, so I'm gonna save my breath here, but they are obviously something that From Software was really passionate about being a part of the Bloodborne experience. This is a great way to get good loot, farm blood echoes, do some PvP, level up, and just generally play more Bloodborne. So overall, I do really like them. They add a ton of just free replayability to the game, where if you're someone who likes the combat, the gameplay loop, and also enjoys kind of grinding and dungeon crawling, I mean this is like cocaine. You will love it. However, I understand the negative feelings towards them. First off, they are a little confusing at first, and it seems like this really important thing to do, the way it's presented and how often you come across relevant materials and whatnot, but it's actually, for the most part, completely and totally optional. I mean, you can play through the entire main game and never even bother. It's also, well, a little samey at times, and especially at the beginning. I mean, the nature of it being kind of randomly generated, you see the same tile sets and the same enemies for long stretches of progress, and I know personally a couple friends who just never felt inclined because of that initial wall. Just dark dungeon repeating. The fucking casuals. So perhaps the system could do with a little more explaining and clarity, but hey, this is from software, man. They hardly tell you how to use the controller. Player versus player action is something that you also should always expect going into a game like this. Invasions are some of the most fun I have ever had in any game back with Dark Souls 1 and 2, and I fully expected to have that same itch scratched by Bloodborne. Now some of this critique I'm about to share might not stand the test of time, and I am okay with that. I spent the bulk of my time with the game when it launched and shortly after the DLC. What I mean to say is when the population was probably peaking. So things may very well have changed by now, or if the game is re-released in the future, things could be different. But back in the good old days, it was extremely easy and common to hop in and get invaded or invade someone else. I mean, I think I have probably experienced a couple hundred hours of just pure PvP, and I had a ton of fun. Kind of. Now, if there was one good way to describe it, I would call the flow of an average fight here in Bloodborne sloppy. That fast-paced combat I raved about for so long is of course still present here in PvP, but when you have two players that can run around wildly like Naruto, it can begin to border on goof. Also, the other mechanic I love so much, Rally, can lead to a shit ton of just straight up spamming in PvP to keep your HP up over your enemies, then dash away, blood vial, dash back in, try to get your range, and it's it's like an anime, straight up. That's the other issue, the blood vials. Healing in Bloodborne is quick. You aren't stopping to take a sip of juice and getting stuck in an animation. You're just kind of injecting your leg, and you can do this even while moving. So it's yet another thing to spam when you're in trouble in a fight. I think you see what I mean here. The lack of deliberate movement in the average encounter makes it feel less like a duel and more like a race or a Mario Party minigame where you just mash one button over and over again. However, if by some chance you find an honorable opponent, some other galaxy brain gamer like yourself who appreciates the subtlety of combat, the strategy, the honor and grace, you can potentially have some of the most incredible, nail-biting, cinematic and fun one-on-one -on -one fights in any video game like ever. From my experience, this got better as the player base got smaller and more dedicated. I mean, hell, I bet if you went online today, you would find some people who just love the game and want to duel, at least at a higher rate than back when the game first came out. Although, caveat is those guys are probably so good you're gonna get your ass beat, but hey, that's life. Another small gripe here with all player interaction is that they've actually done away with summoning signs for Bloodborne. Instead, you just kinda have to ring a bell and pray. The lack of convenience is definitely felt when compared to even 2009's Demon Souls, so that's just kind of a head-scratcher to me. I don't know why they did that. 
So overall, I might feel slightly let down by the PvP scene looking back on all of my hours of experiences, but with all these new systems, it was probably silly of me to expect the thing that I had already done in other games, and I can absolutely appreciate what Bloodborne has to offer here. I guess I just wish I had more good memories as opposed to annoying ones. And I sadly have one more gripe with this near-perfect game, but it has nothing to do with design or gameplay or anything like that. It is the goddamn performance. Holy smokes, boys. This game runs like hot swamp booty. Entering certain areas will just tank your FPS for a couple seconds, and I have even had issues within certain boss fights. I mean, this is a game where every frame of movement, every inch matters. So it's really frustrating to me that issues like this made it into the final launch. But wait, aha, the game is now playable on PS5, the beefiest beefcake console I have ever owned. So surely, we can finally play at 60 FPS, 4K, all the good stuff? No. Ah, oh, well, at least, thank God, the stuttering issues are completely gone here. However, even on PS5, it is locked to a stinky 30 frames per second. Now maybe I'm a snob, but how can you blame me? So many console games and PC games alike are expected to run at 60 FPS these days. Even at the time, Bloodborne felt a bit jarring to get used to. I mean, going from the Demon Souls remake back to Bloodborne feels something like this. Okay, I'm probably being a little dramatic, sure, but hey, it's my right to be dramatic, okay? I'm a man on the internet with a YouTube channel, you can't stop me. All of these technical issues were well documented even at the time, but just kind of put an unnecessary grainy filter over an absolute masterpiece. Finding negatives in Bloodborne is kind of like pointing out the faults in your best best friend. You know they have them, but you love the dude so much, you honestly forget. I mean, it's a tired cliche, but no game is perfect, right? Except for KOTOR. But every single game, even the ones that really fulfill and satisfy us, have a few things about them we wish we could change, right? I mean, it's the nature of the medium, and person-to-person -person opinion will vary on most of these issues anyway, outside of the performance stuff. I think Bloodborne is a game so large in scale, effort, and accomplishment, it can be difficult to talk about in general terms. There's just so much here. I mean, the lore alone is something I really want to dig into. It has entire corners of this website dedicated to it. All the bosses, characters, areas, the enemies. Obviously, I could go on, and I probably will in other videos. But the title of this video is We Don't Deserve Bloodborne. And I think that's my overall feel about the game. We were already given Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1, Dark Souls 2, and then later 3, and Bloodborne is just kind of sitting there in the middle quietly possibly the best game out of all of them but each has its strengths i know i just don't know what we the people did to deserve this one-off project this weird dark experiment this cinematic horrifying thought-provoking rage inducing experience it almost feels too good to be true and yet here the damn thing is now this might sound weird but i almost don't want a sequel or any more than what we already have except a 60 fps patch maybe I think Bloodborne is a testament to the incredible games that companies we love can provide when they are able to disconnect from the established series and try something new. Not held back in any way by expectation or stroking the fandom. I mean, later on, Sekiro did something very similar. It went where no Souls game had gone before, and that is also an incredible game. We can only hope that Elden Ring is the best one yet. And I guess now that Dark Souls has kind of concluded with Dark Souls 3, everything from software gives us from here on out could be a Bloodborne. Now that makes me excited. So as we do in these reviews, my friends, we have to plug it into the old opinion omatic and come to some sort of verdict. This is easy for me. Bloodborne is granted the score by the powers invested in me of a 94. Minor issues I have with weapon selection, PvP, performance, and so on, just honestly can't weigh down the game that much. I walk away forgetting about all of those things I don't like, with my head spinning and my jaw practically on the floor. I know we all see those crappy lists that go around the internet, like top 10 games you must play before you die, and so on, and I always see Dark Souls included, rightfully so. But I, with confidence and gusto, consider Bloodborne also a top 10 must-play video game for anyone who is even remotely interested. I can promise you personally, you will not be disappointed. So, that wraps up the first review of 2022. 
pretty fun, man, to look back on some of these games that I love, and I have many more in the pipeline that I would love to make. But as always, drop a comment below. What do you think of Bloodborne? What other games would you like to see reviewed? What do you order when you get a deli sandwich? I also think I want to try to make some reviews that are more critical. I mean, I've made three reviews about games that I fucking love. So how about some stinkers? Comment down below what you think I should look at. Thanks everyone so much for watching and listening to the end. As always, it means a ton. And I will see you all very soon. Until next time. Peace!